Hello, hello, hello. It's good to see you again. Welcome from Freedom Mountain. It's Dr. Peg again back this week. And I hope that you've had a restful week and that things are going well. And so I just want to remind you, as I've been reminded, to uh, just to tell you to make sure that you share so that we can include those who might not remember that we're on this evening. So just want to remind you to push the share button so we can include our friends and family. And I uh, just want to remind you that we're in the end times. And so this is a time that we need to be reaching out and gathering those into the fold and encouraging them to make a commitment to the Lord. And so I just want to remind you just to push that share button so that as we're getting started, people can come and join us. And uh, I just want to say that it's been a nice, cool week. Uh, we've seen uh, lots of uh, chilly nights, good nights to uh, sleep by. And uh, so we're grateful for that. Some good fresh air here on the mountain. Fall is definitely coming. And um, we're bound to see some beautiful leaves in the next couple weeks changing colors. And uh, so we're excited about that. So I just want to encourage you to find a comfy spot and to uh, get your Bible, find your notebook, get your pen, get settled in, get yourself a drink or a blanket if you need to snuggle in since it's a chilly evening. Um, the Lord has a special word for us this evening. And uh, I just want to make sure that everyone is ready with a pen and paper uh, to take notes. There's definitely some things that you're going to want to go back this week and to study out further. And so I want to encourage you uh, to take some excellent notes. There will be moments that I'll try to pause to give you enough time to write down the scriptures and anything else that you might need to know so that when we finish and uh, you come back to your notebook this week, you will be aware of what it is that you wanted to do. So I just want to start off this evening by saying that if you're settled in, just go ahead and open your Bible to Daniel chapter 4. That's where we're going to start tonight. Uh, and uh, while we're gathering in, I just kind of want to give you an overview of the last several years where we've been uh, collectively as a people and uh, bring you up to snuff so that you can see what season we're in and get a feel for where we're at and just give you a highlight of some of the things that are happening here in our country. So uh, back in the summer of 2016 here at Elisha's home, we had a season of awakening uh, where we realized that uh, the church body as a whole collectively was sitting uh, in a stagnant position of complacency. And the Lord called us out of that and said, awake, awake. And so uh, we spent time in the Word and we spent time on bended knee as we had this fresh awareness, awareness in the Spirit. And so it was a season of awakening. And then in August 2016, um, the Lord called our portion of the body to come together and to repent uh, for the sins of racism that had happened in the past and was present uh, in that particular time uh, in Susquehanna County, the territory which God has assigned us to. And so we came together as a collective body and prayed and uh, repented and asked for forgiveness with our brothers and our sisters uh, from Camp Cuff and some of our brothers and sisters from the city of Philadelphia that were visiting that weekend. And God, God moved. God moved. And so I rejoice in that, the revival that took place in our hearts, the cleansing and the cleansing that continues to happen. And then in uh, 2016 to 2019, when we look over the overview, we see little surges of the Holy Spirit. And we see revival, little moments where God touched individual hearts. And that's what revival is. Revival is not always this humongous gathering of mega people 
oftentimes we'll see revival that happens collectively into individual hearts and little groups of people like ambers that are being fanned and the fire takes off and it will take a, off across the country. So we praise God for that. Then in summer, the summer of 2019 recently, uh, we heard the Lord say that change was a coming. And so, uh, in all honesty, when the Lord gave me that word, I have to confess, I had no idea what that meant. Connected in with Him, we needed to repent, we needed to get things cleaned up, we needed to get right with God. I had no idea that the pandemic was coming. I had no idea that the economic situation would be impacted. I had no idea that there would be some of these other things that have rippled through. But I knew that the Lord had said that change was coming. Beware, change is coming. And so as we look at 2020, last week we spoke about the culture of dishonor. In March of this year, we saw the COVID-19 it came uh, and was destructive worldwide. Uh, it still it still prevails in some places in the world, and uh, it still has not been maintained or controlled. And so we now are looking at rippling effects from that. And so just want to say this: that last week we spoke about the culture of dishonor. And if you did not see that, you can find that on Facebook or you can find that on the YouTube. And that will lead you into and prepare you for the message that you're going to hear this evening. So I want you to sit back for a moment and I want you to think about the things that we have encountered specifically from March till this time in September. I was amazed when I sat and I listed them. And so I'm going to, as I was given by the Lord, I'm going to list them for you. And the Lord might lay it on your heart to write these down so that you can pray over these in specific. So, one of the first things that we saw was an increase in crime and murders specifically in specific large cities. Then we saw criminal profiling on the rise. And then after that, we saw a lack of respect and honor for men in uniform. We saw racism. We saw police brutality. We saw a movement that still is there to defund the police. We saw violence and the demise of peaceful protesting. We see abortion that's been granted within an hour of giving birth in certain states. We've seen the alternative lifestyle. That presence has intensified during this time. We've also seen perverted thinking, pedophilia. Statement, it's a condition, not a crime. That's what is being portrayed in this, in this season. Youth. We had a youth that was arrested for going to his brick and mortar school on an off day in a hybrid learning structure. That's just probably the tip of the iceberg. We could sit for hours probably and speak at a much personal, more personal level and speak about other things that we've seen, right? illnesses, catastrophes at a personal level. If you look at the United States at this point, you've got the West Coast that's on fire. You've got the southern part that's being hammered by a, a hurricane. Time to wake up, people. Time to wake up. Time to wake up. So, you know, all of those things that I listed, I'm sure you were sitting there and saying, you know what, I got an opinion about that. Well, that's nice. But you know what, this evening, I'm not interested in what your opinion is. I'm more interested in the condition of your heart. All right, we all can sit and we can 
have an opinion as to why we think what we think. But you know what? When it comes down to the crux, our opinion really doesn't matter. Our heart condition matters. And as we collectively join together with our hearts in rightness with God, that's what's going to turn around all of these horrific situations that we have in our country right now. So, genuinely speaking, I am concerned about each of our heart conditions our spiritual heart conditions. And so it is easy for us in this season to blame shift. It's easy to blame our president. It's easy to blame our governors. It's easy to blame someone of a different race. It's easy to blame the meteorologist because you didn't get the weather report correct. You name it. But blame shifting has been around since the very beginning of creation. If you look in Genesis 3, you'll see that Eve blamed Adam and Adam blamed Eve. It's always somebody else's fault. Well, guess what? Every mom knows that, you know what, when the children get into a spat, usually they don't figure it out on their own unless you've allowed them to practice that Usually it takes mom to get in the middle and to say, okay, enough is enough. And for mom to sort it out and to lay it out. So I'm just going to say, as your mom, I'm going to lay it out for you. It's not about it being the president's fault. It's not about that it's a certain race's fault. It's not about that it's the police's fault. This evening, we're going to talk about the fact that our hearts are not right. And we need to get to the crux. We need to get to the root. We need to cleanse our hearts as a nation. And then as we cleanse our hearts, we will begin to look at things as Christ would look at them. Instead of in our man, our man eyes. We want to look in our spiritual eyes. And so this evening, we're going to spend time again speaking about the evil root of pride. So you all know that when you, and you're going to see in the scriptures this evening, when you're cutting down a tree, it's really important that you get the entire stump, you get all of the roots out, right? Because if you don't get all of the roots out, sure enough, in a few months, you're going to see a little what? You're going to see a little sprout come right up through. And you're going to see a tree start to grow again. So I say to you that, you know what, we're going to dig out the evil root again, and that evil root is pride. And so this evening, we're going to take a look at Daniel chapter 4. We're going to be looking at a king who was one of the most prideful kings that ever graced the face of the earth. And before we get started, we're going to take a moment, we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into that. So if you have your Bible, you want to be opened up to Daniel chapter 4. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us and that you continue to love us with unconditional love. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you continue to try to woo us into your arms and that you try to convince us and to convey to us that we need to lay down our lives and we need to commit to follow you and that we need to live in accordance to the precepts of the new covenant which we have with you when we come to the base of the throne and we uh, make you Lord of our life and you become Savior of our life. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that love. We thank you for new mercies and new grace that we awaken to each and every morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. We ask that you would come and you would abide with us. You would teach us. You would speak to us. That our eyes, our spiritual eyes would be open, our spiritual ears would be open, and that we would be receptive to change our hearts. That we would be receptive to bow down on our knees and give you honor and glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So, you've often heard uh, the expression, pride goes before the destruction, and that's in the scriptures. 
That's in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, and the, the remaining portion of that verse, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Let me read it again. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Keep that in mind. Also, in James chapter 4, verse 6, we see that God is opposed to the proud. He's opposed to the man or the woman who is prideful. And we find in Proverbs chapter 16, 5, he tells us that the prideful man or woman is an abomination to God. And so with God so set against the proud, no wonder pride goes before destruction. Then in James chapter 4, verse 6, we read, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So if someone says that you are a prideful person, that is not a compliment. That's an insult. That's a slap in the face in the spiritual. It's called a wake up. Wake up. You don't want to be prideful. You want to be a person that's filled with humility and humbleness because then that means that you give credit to God and that it's God that gets the honor, not you. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. And so then in 16.5 of Proverbs, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Hmm. So stop and think with me about pride. You know, oftentimes, you know, I, I might say to you, well, what is pride? And everybody might have a different description. But immediately when I ask you what pride is, you might think of a specific person. And you would say, ha ha. That person is a really good example of pride. Well, you better hope that your name doesn't come up in that conversation. That's not a good thing. All right? So pride, first, uh, it opposes the first principle of wisdom. We are instructed to fear the Lord, meaning that we are instructed to have reverence and respect for the Lord, to give honor and to give credit to the Lord. We don't see a whole lot of that going on, right? We don't see a whole lot of respect from young people to the elderly. We don't see respect from one race to another race. I could go on and on and on about the places that we do not see respect. And so I just want you to be thinking about that. Now, if you just take a moment and close your eyes, I want you to visualize for just a moment. And to speak to the men because the men are going to get this right away. Men, if you see a bulging wall, what do you think? You think, uh-oh, it's going to fall, right? It's not stable. There's water damage. There's damage somewhere. It's going to fall. It's going to collapse. It needs to be inspected, and it needs to be, what? It needs to come under inspection, and then it needs to be either taken down or it needs to be repaired, right? Right? And so now I'm going to include women, okay, because I don't want the men to think that I'm picking on them because I'm not. This is for men and women, all right? So when your ego swells in your head, as soon as you realize that you've got a swollen ego, beware, you're ready to fall. When you think that you're all that in a bag of chips, as my daughter-in-law Nadira would say, that means that you are on the brink of falling, on the brink of destruction. So... If you're a medical person, you, you know that swelling in the body is a dangerous sim symptom. And so, as well as pride to the soul or to the spirit, to the heart, is a very serious, serious symptom. So Baxter once said, so far as any man is proud, he is kin to the devil and a stranger to God and to himself. Let me read that again to you. Baxter said this. So far as any man is proud, he is kin to the devil and a stranger to God and to himself. Hmm. Interesting. So let's stop and just talk about what pride is. 
Pride is an attitude that communicates that you are better than other people. And it doesn't have to be better across in everything. But you can see that where somebody says, well, you know, I could have had that job. Or, you know, I could do that better. Or, you know, it should be done like this. Or, you know, I already did that. I already accomplished that. I did this and I did that and I did that. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. How many eyes did you just count? Anytime that you hear I popping out of the woodwork, you've got pride popping out all over the place. You're looking at destruction that's on its way. You're looking for a fall. And so let's take a look at uh, Daniel chapter 4 now. If you've got the word open, I'm going to give you a simple introduction. Then we're going to go right into the word. So uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to be talking about the pride that we saw in his reign and how God dealt with that. His name means Nebo. And Nebo means to defend the boundary. And then his Akkadian name means, O oh God, Nabu, defend my firstborn. And so the God of Nabu is the Babylonian God who was the son of the God of Marduk who is the God of wisdom and learning in mythology, all right? So King Nebuchadnezzar's father, his name was Nebopalasser. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. He led a successful campaign against the Assyrians and founded the Babylonian Empire. And so historically, we know that King Nebuchadnezzar was a prideful man. And you say, well, how do we know that? Well, I'll tell you, if we read some historical documents, we find that in the city of Babylon, there were enormous walls. And on those walls, there were inscriptions that have been found in modern day. And this is what the inscription said. I, Nebuchadnezzar, made this. So he's like a five-year-old in an art class. They draw a picture. And they put their name on and their name is bigger than the picture. Because in their little mind, they're saying, I made this beautiful picture. And anybody that walks by, I want them to know that I painted this picture. Again, we hear the I, 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 I. And so we see that as we study out historically this king, he prided himself more in the construction that he made in the architectural world than he actually did in his military victories, which is kind of fascinating. So we find in his reign that the temples were restored, and so they were magnificent. They were erected to many of the gods of Babylon while he was in his reign. We find that he shared no expense, or he spared no expense, uh, in the completion of the palace in which he lived in, it was the palace that his father had begun. And we find that he used the most expensive cypress wood in addition to gold, silver, bronze, and precious stones all through the palace. And then we find that Babylon was separated by the Euphrates River, which ran through it. But Nebuchadnezzar decided that it needed to be connected so he made an underground passage with a stone bridge made of brick and asphalt. And due to this, the city could not be penetrated by its enemies because on the outside, he had a construction of triple lined walls. Triple lined walls. Now back then when they made a wall, oftentimes it was at least... Pretty thick compared to what we would see today. But the historian Heroditus, he writes that the walls were, get ready, this is something you might want to write down if you're a historian, 56 miles in length, 80 feet thick. Yeah, 80 feet. I can't even wrap my brain around that. 80 feet thick, 320 feet high. Again, can't wrap my brain around it. 
Historians write that it was wide enough for a four-horse chariot to turn around. So a four-horse chariot, that's pretty wide, pretty wide. So we also know that Nebuchadnezzar was the creator of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And if you know anything about the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world, the gardens is one of the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful. And so he built the gardens as a gift to his wife. She uh, was discouraged. She was homesick. And so he felt that if he made this beautiful, beautiful garden, that it would remind her of her home and which she came from. So he used the Euphrates River to irrigate the gardens uh, as we know that Babylon didn't get much rain. So that in its time was unheard of that they would be irrigating. And so that was impressive. Very, very intelligent, um, prosperous, ingenuitive, ingenuitive person. And so during this era when he reigned, we see that Babylon thrived in the area of art. It thrived in the area of literature and also in the science realm, which is fascinating for that period of time. So let's take a look now at Daniel chapter 4. And so this particular portion, the first three verses, is entitled Nebuchadnezzar's Dream of the Tree. Dream of the Tree. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, this is a unique chapter in the word. This is a chapter of testimony of a Gentile king and how God changed his heart. And so he, he starts out as a prideful man. And then we begin to see after he goes through the experience that he's going to tell you about, he becomes a man of humility, a great testimony. And so he is an excellent example of a witness, a witness that gives a testimony of something that he has seen and something he has experienced. So you know how in the past we've always talked about that when you have a testimony and you've experienced something, you know that you know that you know the scripture says it and you experienced it, you walked through it, you came out on the other side victorious. And so it does not matter what anyone says when they try to persuade you that it's not truth. You know that you know that you know because you went through it. And you had the word beside you that was the foundation of your experience. And so you give credence and credit to God who brought you through. And so notice that he says, it is good to declare what God has done for us. So let's stop and think about that. Have you ever had um, something wonderful happen and you give credit to God and you give up, you get up and you give a testimony or you meet up with somebody at the grocery store and they're going through something. And so you've gone through something like that. You testify and then you go home and there's a self-talk and you begin to doubt whether you should have shared or whether you should have kept your lips buttoned up and not said anything, right? That's typical. Many, many people go through that. That is a typical strategy to get you to shut up and not to give testimony to glorify God. And so we see that very often. So remember that he tells us that God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar was a great king that he recognized. And he tells us in this chapter that he recognized that God's kingdom was far greater. And so God's dominion was completely unique because it's an everlasting kingdom. We'll never see a kingdom like that here on the face of earth. Now, when we go on to glory, we'll get to experience that. And what a wonderful day that will be. Let's take a look now. We're in Daniel chapter 4, verse 4 through 9. 
And we find in this particular portion of scripture that only Daniel can explain the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And so starting in verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at the rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream. But they did not make known to me its interpretation, but at last Daniel came before me. His name was Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Daniel, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. Now, let me just say this to you. When you hear the interpretation of this dream, it seemed pretty straightforward and simple, I wouldn't want to be that person. In other words, you know, when you're a teacher and you ask a question and there's always people that are, ooh, ooh, call on me. And then there's the students that are sitting in the back that put their head down and they won't make eye contact and they cover their eyes and they're praying, dear God, don't let her call on me. I would be one of those people. Dear God, don't let him call on me. Why? This is not this is not an interpretation that would be a joy ride to say, "Hey, I'm so excited to tell you what God's going to do in your life." This was not an easy interpretation. Daniel had come to the point where maybe they didn't serve the same two gods, but he had come to a point where he respected the king and they had a relationship, a close relationship. And so, I want us to take a look at this. So, he says, I was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he was resting in the false peace of the ungodly. And soon God shook him, shook him in his false security. You know, we had um, someone that gave a prophetic word. And the prophet mentioned that, you know, many times you'd be hit, 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 hit. And for an instantaneous moment, and for a little bit, there's a shaking that goes on. And then you get back up, and you go back to serving God at the same point where you were. And you don't let it take over. You don't let it destroy you. You get back up. Pull your big britches up, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Whatever it takes, you get back up, and you get going. And so... This is what the king says. I told them the dream, but they did not make it known to me its interpretation. And so I want to make notice that when you go to study uh, this week, you're going to notice that there was a dream that's given in chapter 2. This is not the same dream. This is a different dream. Keep that in mind. So he had already told his counselors. He'd called them in. Uh, nobody. Nobody was going to tell him what this dream meant. Now, do you think that maybe they knew and they just weren't going to? I think they knew. I think they had the wisdom to tell him, but I think they didn't have the courage. They didn't have the courage. And so they didn't do it. And so it landed in Daniel's lap. And so he says, at last, Daniel came before me. And so you ask, well, why at last? Why wouldn't you have gone there first? You know that the Holy Spirit, the Holy God resides in him. Why didn't you go there first? Was it that you really didn't want to know? Was it that you were afraid of what he would say? I'm not sure. But I want us to think about that, that he, he didn't go to Daniel first. He went to Daniel last. So I want us to think about that in our own, uh, you know, when something happens, what's the first thing you do? Do you go run to the phone and dial up your best friend or the neighbor lady and say, hey, guess what just happened to me? Or do you go run to your, what, to your prayer, your prayer closet to say, hey, God, 
you know, I know you already know this, but like, this just happened to me. What does this mean? What do you want me to do? No, we call up umpteen people and we still don't have our answer. And then we go to God, right? It's a pattern. And it was the pattern for this king. And so Daniel did interpret the dream. And uh, we need to keep in mind that, you know, it is a magnificent thing that he called on Daniel because uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he did not honor God, the one true God, as his God. He worshipped the Babylonian deity Bel as his God. So I want you to keep that in mind. You know, Daniel and the three friends of his, they have impressed him by, and imprinted on him, but not to the point that he's ready to convert or that he's ready to bow down and make a confession. And so, uh, you know, just remember that, that, you know, people are watching you. And as, as they're watching you, you can't give up. You have to keep up um, that godly character that godly reputation their eyes are on you stay focused stay focused so that when they're ready to make that commitment you're right there to lead them to the base of the throne looking at verse 10 to 17 these were the visions of my head while on my bed i was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great the tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, he cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree, cut out its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beast on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast. And let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers. And the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. Gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. Let's take a look now. A tree in the midst of the earth. So this was in the middle of his dream. It was The tree was noted for its strength, for its prominence, for its beauty, for its fruit, for its shelter. And then he cried out at last and he said, that there was a watcher. Now, presumably, we would think a watcher is an angel. He explained the fate of the tree, and then he said that it was to be chopped down and that it would lose its size, it would lose its strength, its prominence, its beauty, its fruit, and its shelter. He also said that the tree represented a man who would be changed, and that man was King Nebuchadnezzar, and so that he would be given the heart of a beast. And so, then notice the next phrase, that we, he would be bound with a band of iron and bronze. And so, we find that this tree stump was confined. And the confinement could have been for protection. We're not exactly sure, but the tree would no longer be free. It would no longer be great. And then we look at the phrase, in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, he heard these words in his dream. And in light of this, the dream wasn't a hard dream to interpret. It was that he was to give it straight to the king in love and that it would be a humbling of this great king. And so notice no one wanted to interpret this dream but Daniel stepped up boldness, courageously, in the Holy Spirit, and he gave the interpretation to the king. 
certainly not an interpretation that you'd want to be giving, nor would it be an, uh, an interpretation that you would be on the end of being the recipient either. And so we notice in verse 18, uh, and before we go into verse 18, I just want to remind you that in Nebuchadnezzar's heart, he believed that he ruled the world instead of God. And that is not a good place. That is not a good place to be. Not a good place. So, looking at verse 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, declare its interpretation. Since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of a holy God is in you. So, he knew that he could get an honest answer from Daniel. He knew that even when the truth was going to be difficult to deliver and that it was going to be difficult for him to hear, he knew that Daniel was the man of the hour. And so he, note, he declares the spirit of the Holy God. And he knew it. He identified it. So how many times do we find people that we run into that they know, they know of God, they can identify him, but yet they have not what? They've not laid down their heart. They've not made that commitment to God to allow him to come in and have control. They still want to have that control. So notice in verse 19 through 26, we see Daniel's explanation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Let's read verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was found for all, which was food for all, under which the beast of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heavens, and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. They shall drive you from men, for dwelling shall be with the beast. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. And so Daniel's thoughts troubled him. He genuinely cared for this king. Can you imagine delivering that interpretation, how that would impact you? Can you imagine saying that to someone that you looked up to as a friend, as a friend. And so we had to really stop and think how Daniel must have felt. And so Daniel gave, Daniel gave the interpretation. He was obedient in accordance to the Holy Spirit. He brought the truth in love. And yet I'm sure that it was disturbing to him. If you have your notebook, I have a few scriptures that you might be interested in studying this week. There's many great men and princesses, princes that are often represented in the language of the prophets under the similitude of trees. And so you could look up 
and study Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 5 through 6, and then Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 3. Let me say that again. Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 5 and 6, and then Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 3, and also in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 15, and then in Psalms chapter 1, verse 3, Psalms chapter 1, verse 3, and then Psalms chapter 37, verse 35. And so again, we're seeing great men and princes that are often represented in the language of the prophets in the similitude of trees. Interesting. So notice that he says to him, you're going to be driven from men, you're going to eat grass like oxen, and you're going to be wet with the dew of heaven. Now, do you think that do you think the king really thought that you know what? I'm going to lose my sanity and I'm going to go out with the beast of the field and I'm going to be like an ox. Yum yum, I'm going to eat grass for 7 seasons. I wouldn't if I were standing there, I wouldn't I can't fathom that. So I say to myself, you know, what did, what did that king think? Did he think that it was literal? Or did he think that it was... Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? And so then notice it says, after you come to know what heaven rules. So the king could have avoided this, this humiliating fate had he only given credit and credence to the king, right? That's all God wanted. He wanted him to state, okay, you are the God of the universe. You are the king of all kings. You got this. I'm just simply this person that's running over Babylon. But that wasn't, that wasn't his mindset. That was not his heart. And so in verse 27, Daniel being the person that he was, he pressed home the application of this particular prophetic word. And so he drives in, repent before it's too late. Repent, repent, repent. And so this is what he says in verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous. And your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So break off your sins. Break off your sins by being righteous. And the first step of being righteous is to get on bended knee and to repent. In humility. In humility. All right. So break off your sins. So, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't do this. He didn't do this. He could have followed the example of repentance like what we saw in the city of Nineveh when um, Jonah went out and preached even though he didn't want to be there and he didn't want to do it. But he drug himself there and he made himself be obedient. But we see the people of Nineveh came on bended knee and Jonah never thought that that was going to happen. He presumed that they'd walk away and not but they came on bended knee. And so he could have used that as an example and just came on bended knee. And then he would not have had to go out like an oxen and eat grass. So uh, let's move over to the little portion where he says, Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. So when we're righteous and we're um, ministering to the needs of the poor, we are exemplifying and exhibiting the heart of Christ. And then we know that, you know, when we came to repent, we know that the fruit of our heart is when we reach out in love to take care of those that are orphans and the widows and we're doing good things for others out of out of Christ's love. And so Nebuchadnezzar was counseled 
to stop sinning, to practice righteousness, and to practice being generous. Now, the generous thing, that could have been a really easy thing for him. He had gobs of cattle and gobs of horses. and I mean, he just had prosperity oozing out of his pores. That could have been very easy, except for his heart wasn't right. He had all of the things that he could do that. He had the things, but the heart wasn't right. When we look at the fulfillment of the dream in verse 28 through 33, let's take a look at the scriptures. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, It is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to the gives it to whomever he chooses. In that very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So at the end of 12 months, he had 12 months to repent. And so he may have forgotten about the dream. And yet God didn't forget. Nebuchadnezzar may have forgotten, but God did not forget. And so, remember that we look at the spectacular Babylon and we think, you know what, spectacular city of the ancient world, there's no way that that could happen, but it did happen. And it's historically documented. So I just want to say to you that uh, Daniel knew that the new Babylon was the creation of Nebuchadnezzar. And we see that in Daniel chapter 4 verse 30. And we see that it has been verified by recent archaeology. And so just wanted to bring that to you. In the British Museum, there are six columns of writing recovered from Babylon with descript of huge building projects of Nebuchadnezzar and his zeal to enlarge and beautify the city. Most of the bricks found in the excavations of the Babylon carry this stamp. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, supporter of Esagila and Azida, exalted firstborn son of Nebo Pelasar, king of Babylon. There it is. History verifies scripture. There it is. And so the portion of scripture, they shall drive you from men, eat grass like oxen. These are the same words that he heard in his dream. And so he knew that he knew that his dream was about to be fulfilled and he was reduced to the existence of an animal. And so uh, the form of insanity in which men think of themselves as an animal actually exists. They imitate the behavior of the animal that has been observed and... There is a lovely name, and I'm not sure that I'm going to pronounce this correctly, so forgive me, but I'm going to give it a good try. So, this condition uh, is sometimes called Insania Zoanthropica. And in Nebuchadnezzar's case, we find that it's Boanthropy, the delusion that one is an ox. Look it up. It really is a thing. I was shocked when I found that. So he was driven from men and he did eat grass like an oxen. And so we find that he had seven seasons of a period of insanity. And so we find that there's nothing recorded about the king during those seven seasons. And that would be typical of the culture in that time. That there was not something commendable to be written. Nothing was written. There was Nothing negative. There was nothing written. And so we see that we can't dismiss his madness. We know that there's no historical record during his time of insanity 
as to his governmental activity, and that would have been between the years of 582 BC and 575 BC. There's nothing empty, zilch. And so uh, the New Eastern leaders uh, trumpet their achievements and they hide their embarrassments. And so those seven years were hidden. There's nothing documented that he did during those seven years. So we don't find any inscriptions with those years on. And the I built this. There's nothing there. Verse 34 to 37. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all of whose works are true and his ways justice and those who walk in pride he is able to put down so at the end of time nebuchadnezzar could not break from his madness until god gave the appointed time after seven seasons so he was not in control god was in control you know, if he said at season five, okay, I get it, whatever, let me loose. No, God said seven seasons. So during that seven seasons, he had an opportunity to humble himself and lift his eyes to heaven and rejoice and declare. And so he says, I bless the most high and praised and honored him. And so he sees the truth of himself and he sees the truth of the one true God for the very first time. And so... uh Oftentimes, we don't spend enough time in worship. And I can assure you that after this revelation, that he would have gone into worship. Uh, remember when you first got saved, that fire that was burning? And some of us, that fire goes out on occasion. You need to get back into worship. Spend hours in worship, days in worship, whatever it takes to get that zeal back. That zeal, that fire, that passion in your walk so then note he says i was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me so god wanted to restore nebuchadnezzar the goal was not to take him bring him low but it was to put him in his proper place before god and among men and then he would be able to learn to walk in humility in his proper place giving respect, reverence to the one true God. He had to know his place, just as many of us do not know our place. We need to get back to that. We need to be humbled. And notice in James chapter 4, 6, I remind you, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so Nebuchadnezzar came to know and to establish a relationship with the one true God he had an experience and he gave testimony of that experience. So notice that Nebuchadnezzar's madness foreshadows the madness of the Gentile nations in their rejection of God. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar's fall typifies Jesus' judgment of the nations. We also see that Nebuchadnezzar's restoration foreshadows the restoring of some of these nations in the millennial kingdom when they come in humility and bow down and make him Lord of their life and Lord of their nation. And so it is not God's uh, decree or his uh, desire to destroy them or uh, his desire to just punish for the sake of punishing, but it's his desire that they will come to repentance. And so in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord 
uh, is not slack in concerning his promise. Some men are slackers. They slack, but God is not. He is long-suffering to us. He's not willing that we should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. His arms are open and he's asking, come, come. That's his desire. So God warns Nebuchadnezzar with a dream. He sends his prophet to interpret the dream. He gives Nebuchadnezzar another chance. He gives him an entire year to heed to Daniel's advice in verse 27. And he spares Nebuchadnezzar's life and he humbles him. And so God loves proud people. He doesn't hate them per se in the sense that he wants to kill them. He loves them. However, he hates the sin of pride. He loves the sinner. He's a God that is long-suffering towards us. And his desire is that we would come in humility to him and bow down and make him Lord of our life. And so I say to you, we are in the crux of a season, of a time that we need to come on bended knee. We need to lay down the pride. We need to lay down the pride as a country. We need to come in humility. We need to revive each one of us one by one until the embers begin to flame and we have revival in our country and we turn away from our sin our sin of pride, the root of, of pride. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the example of King Nebuchadnezzar. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the example of the harsh uh, dream that was had and how Daniel walked out in obedience and brought the message to the king. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that our God is a God who speaks and that we thank you, Heavenly Father, that as you speak to us, that you keep your word. We never have to wonder if you're going to change your word. We never have to wonder uh, if you say one thing out of one side of your mouth and something out of the other side of your mouth. You are a consistent God. You are a God that's the same today as you were yesterday as you will be tomorrow. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that consistency. We thank you that your desire is to draw us in to the base of the throne, and for us to receive you as Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior of our life. And so I'm just going to ask you that if you're watching with me, that you would just say this prayer with me. Make sure that you have confirmed, that you have committed, that the Lord is the Lord of your life. Heavenly Father, come into my life. I acknowledge you to be Lord and Savior of my life. I recognize that I was a sinner and that your son hung on that cross. He shed his blood for my sins. I ask and receive you now as Lord and King and Savior of my life. I now decree and declare that I will live my life in accordance to the scriptures in which you have put before me. I declare and decree that I, if I don't have a church, Heavenly Father, that I will look to you to put someone in my midst, to guide me to a church, to fellowship, to provide discipleship, to teach me, and to help me walk out the remainder of my life as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve the one true God. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing on all those that are watching. I pray, Heavenly Father, for health and well, good well-being in all aspects, financially, physically, Physically, I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you restore, that you restore, you restore incompleteness and perfection, that you heal all. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for that. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless and draw nigh to you. All those that have been watching, I ask Heavenly Father that they would have a profitable week as they sit under your teaching and that they would study and that they would yearn to spend time with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for coming and joining us this evening. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. We thank you for your touch. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love us 
and that you are there to protect us and to walk before us, behind us, and beside us. We give you honor and glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been a blast to be here with you this evening and to study with you. I hope that you'll return next Wednesday. Remember that on Friday night, one of the pastors will be here at 7. And then on Sunday morning, they'll be back at 10 again. And so uh, on Tuesdays then, you can also see Pastor Rob and he will bring you a message. So remember that those uh, times are posted on the Facebook Live. We uh, pray that you'll join us again. It's been a blessing to worship with you and to study with you. We say be blessed and we'll see you next week. Take care now. God bless.